My basic message, and it's not that different from what a lot of other people have said, but it inquire, involves a different perspective because of my focus on politics. The transition that we need to clean energy is feasible. It is affordable, but it actually requires significant changes. And those significant changes need to be led by politicians who have particular sorts of constraints. Uh, they need to raise prices. When they try to raise prices, if you watch what happens with, for example, in the UBB case, usage-based billing, or recently with BC Hydro, what kind of response you get from that, you can see why they're so cautious in doing so. That reluctance can only be overcome with massive social pressure. Here's another indication. You've already gotten others today. Uh, somebody mentioned Princeton. This is Stanford. It doesn't really matter what Ivy League or other high quality university you want to talk about. The best experts in the world who study this are telling us it's feasible. You can build an energy system that uh, can produce the energy services that we need in a clean and sustainable fashion. We know that now, but we seem stuck. We're stuck on this uh, political issue. And I want to talk about how to get through that. The first is, also with respect to feasibility, the policy wonks, the people who study policy instruments, are enormously confident that we know how to drive that transformation. There's a series of tools in the policy toolkit that we have available to us, the most important of which are an economy-wide carbon tax or an economy-wide system of cap and trade. The people who study this believe those things can work more or less in the same way. It doesn't matter which one you choose, but you need one of them to internalize the costs of environmental damage that we're creating through the energy system and drive the change. And those should be supplemented uh, with some other policies to help drive that transformation. When we do this stuff, I realize there's a lot of words and a lot of colors, but I tried to make it seem <laughs> like it's uh, a traffic light system. You think about what your alternatives are. You could try to teach people to be more sustainable through the use of uh, information and persuasion. You could try to bribe them by giving them more money to do so. You could tax them into it. You could have one of these more elaborate systems of marketable permits in cap and trade. Or you could do a more old-fashioned route of command and control regulation. We have a series of choices uh, that are available to us. And then there's a series of things we want out of them. We want it to be effective. We need it to be uh, cost efficient. We need it to be workable administratively. And we also need it to be politically plaus plausible. And that's the extra ingredient that I really want to add in here. There are trade-offs in terms of what the different instruments give us for these different criteria. For example, uh, the things that are most politically palatable, unfortunately, are least effective. You need to have uh, actions by government that either uh, force people to do things through compulsory rules or uh, provide financial incentives for them to do th so by penalizing undesirable behavior. These things involve increasing energy costs. So it's very important. We need to increase energy costs. The next step in the logic is to see that we can do that without bankrupting uh, ourselves and the system. The costs that we need to increase are significant. It's one of the biggest changes that we need to make in society in order to get uh, into a sustainable framework. But it's also affordable. All the studies that have been done by economists of the sorts of changes that need to be made to get to a safe level, and I point you to the, to the highest one up there, the 445 to 535. This is CO2 equivalent, so that's relatively comparable to the 350 that people like uh, Bill McKibben talk about. We can do that by uh, less than 3% of gross domestic product, between 2 and 3% of gross domestic product, people normally say. What does that mean? Well, that's a lot. It is actually really expensive. It's similar to the amount of money we already spend on all environmental pollution controls. It's bigger than the Canadian military. It's smaller than the uh, US military. It's many times smaller than we put into healthcare. The way I like to think about it the best is that it's a decent year of economic growth. Would you trade one year of economic growth 
for a relative assurance of a safe climate for your children and grandchildren? I would. Now, the major obstacle to this energy system transformation is a political one. Very important to remember, we actually haven't told you, somebody mentioned, I guess it was Sapporo in the video that we saw, it mentioned Stephen Harper. The decisions about these policy tools are made by politicians. They want to be elected and re-elected. That makes them respond to public opinion. They want to claim credit for things that make people happy and avoid blame for, to, for things that make people angry. The policies that we need are going to increase prices and politicians are reluctant to do that. And the only way they're going to do that is if we can mobilize intense public pressure for them to do so. Why isn't that happening? Well, it's not happening because, as optimistic as we all want to feel, uh, climate change is actually one of the great political challenges we've ever faced because of the structure of the problem. It's because of how the costs of mitigation of transforming the energy system relate to the benefits of doing so. The costs are here. They're local. The benefits are global. If you're paying the carbon tax when you pull up to the pump in your car, you see it immediately. If you are an industrial polluter and you not need to buy a uh, certificate, an environmental certificate, to justify your carbon emissions, you pay those costs right away. The benefits of that, however, are felt globally because of the way the atmospheric system works. And so there's a separation between uh, the here and the global. There's also a, a temporal separation. You pay that carbon tax or that for that emission certificate, you pay it now, but the response to that is something that's going to happen decades from now because of the inertia of the climate system. So that creates a, another challenge. The costs that you pay are quite certain. The dollars are something you pay right away. The benefits, because of the uncertainties in our understanding, because of that very long time lag of response, are highly uncertain. That's a very special and complex kind of difficult uh, challenge. And that type of challenge is one, especially in that first dimension that I talked about there, that spatial dimension of the here versus the global, is because a safe climate is a public good. And when we talk about a public good, what we mean by that is it's something that one person's consumption doesn't take away from another. So that I can breathe clean air, and you can breathe clean air, and we don't take that away from each other, but we also can't exclude anyone else from doing so. That's what we call a public good. When goods have that uh, characteristic, a set of characteristics, it creates a free rider problem where everyone wants to take advantage of the benefits of that, but no one wants to pay the costs. And that free rider problem exists at the individual level when uh, none of us are, are particularly eager to take on those extra costs when everybody else isn't. They exist at the national level when countries blame their own inaction on Chinese inaction, for example. Uh, and they exist at the international level when countries are trying to compete uh, for uh, different kind of investments by keeping their own costs low. So it creates this dilemma of what's called in the scholarship by the, a logic of collective action, or it's actually an illogic of collective action because it's what's frustrating change. It's how the different intensity of preferences mean that the few can triumph over the many. And to illustrate that, I want to go through a relatively simple example with these cute little people in their nice comfy houses. There's 49 of them on the left and four of them on the right. And if the, this was a democracy and uh, we were voting, it would be a landslide. If we did it like a welfare economist and we were doing a net benefit test and everyone had the same stake, and you don't have to measure the stakes in terms of dollars, uh, but if you did, it's an easy way to do it, if you did, and you gave everyone $1,000 stakes, that would be $49,000 compared to $4,000. It's also a slam dunk. It's easy to decide that there would be net benefits for action. But then take the more realistic scenario where the people for action have a $1,000 stake, but the people against action have a much higher stake. In this example, uh, $10,000. And so uh, it, in this case, if you're doing a net benefit test, the, be the benefits of action still significantly outweigh uh, the, the uh, risks of inaction. 
But when you turn the question around from a net benefit test that an economist would apply, and then they keep doing that, keep telling us why it's a good thing to do, to an actual political test of who's more likely to mobilize, the obvious answer is those four people with particularly big stakes, Enax, Exxon, Mobil, Shell, BP, and Peabody Coal, they are the ones who organize effectively, and we don't. So that's the challenge of collective action that the different intensity of preferences affects the ability to organize and grants massive advantages to uh, the opponents of climate action. The challenge is overcoming those. And you've heard some incredibly inspirational uh, videos and talks here about how to do that. Get off your butt. It's not enough to ride your bike instead of driving your car. You've got to get in politicians' faces. If you don't show that intensity of preferences, they will not respond. Join a group. Be influential in it. You don't like the ones that are out there? Make your own. If you don't organize and if you don't mobilize, the few are going to continue to triumph over the many.